Bon matin. Je suis Tyler McCann, dirigeant principal de Good morning. I am Tyler McCann, managing director at the Canadian Agri Food Policy Institute. And it's a pleasure to be with you this morning as the facilitator of our first webinar of 2022, looking ahead, reflecting on 2021 and what will drive ag policy in 2020. 2021 was a year that increased our understanding of Canada's history and the challenges of our history with Canada's First Nation. As we look forward to 2022, it is important that we continue to take steps towards reconciliation. As a small step, I would like to once again acknowledge that I come to you from Western Quebec, the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. Established 17 years ago, CAPI is a policy think tank focusing solely on the agri-food sector bringing insight, evidence, and creative policy solutions to Canada's agri-food system. CAPI creates venues for critical conversations, explains research results to a broad audience, and connects uh, those individuals who have creative ideas to contribute and those who are making impactful policy decisions. As you know, there are major opportunities and risks on the horizon. This past year has reminded us of the importance of an agri-food system that is resilient to disruption. We also need a system that continues to grow to meet increasing global demand for high quality food and a system that enables us to innovate, including to find climate adaptations and solutions. At the same time, we must set Canada's agri-food system apart in an increasingly competitive and complex global environment. We need to find new ways to drive growth, through innovation, creative thinking, and ideas rooted in science and good policy. We can only do this by working together. We invite you to join CAPI as both a knowledge and financial partner to elevate policy dialogue in Canada's agri-food system. Through your partnership, CAPI can continue to be the institution where Canada's agri-food system comes together to create bold, innovative, strategic policy thinking an institution that produces groundbreaking content, critical connections, and bold communications, all of which are actionable, consumable, and timely. Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada identified this need and has been a significant financial partner of CAPI from the beginning, and we are grateful for their continued investment and support. There are many different ways to become involved with CAPI, and we are actively seeking collaborations and funding partners on our work. Please reach out to myself, or Bree Jones, our Director of Fundraising, to explore the different opportunities and join the CAPI mailing list to ensure you stay up to date on future CAPI webinars and research throughout the year. We look forward to connecting with you. CAPI's webinars are a great way for us to connect with stakeholders from across the agri-food system. Our next webinar will be on February 16th and we'll touch on soil health, soil health featuring CAPI's distinguished fellow, Dr. Susan Woodbaum, and CAPI Doctoral Fellow, Mary Elise Sampson. Today's discussion is going to look broadly at agri-food policy, considering in part the year that was with a focus on the year ahead. The policy challenges and opportunities facing the agri-food system in 2022 are almost as diverse as Canada's agri-food system is itself. However, there are common themes that I'm sure will come up in the discussion today. Agriculture's place in climate change policy, the critical need for labor, Shifting international trade dynamics are just a few of these issues. Governments in Canada will also need to come together in 2022 to finalize the new five-year agricultural po policy framework, an opportunity for governments to set meaningful five-year strategies that will guide how they support and drive and promote agri-food policy in Canada. We have assembled four individuals to help us explore agri-food policy in 2022. These four individuals look at policy from different places within the agri-food system and different places across the country. They share a common passion about agriculture and food and the potential that exists for Canada's agri-food system. I will introduce each panelist individually this morning and then ask them a question based on their expertise and experience. Then we will move to questions for the group and questions from the audience. We always find really great questions from Cappy's uh, audience during our webinars, and we encourage you to write your questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. 
Ce matin, je vais commencer avec Lionel Levesque. This morning, I'm going to start with Lionel Levesque. He's a journalist and commentator with Radio Canada for more than 40 years. Lionel Levesque is commander de l'Ordre national du mérite agricole du Québec. Uh, he is the son of an agronomist, and his passion for agri-food, the environment, and rural life is obvious in his blog and podcast, his articles, and all is available on the website of Agro-Québec. His more than 800 news stories have a bit of everything, political analysis, the study of economic tendency, and even interviews on site with men and women farmers. Good morning, Mr. Levac. Yes, hello, hello, everybody. I would like to start with a question concerning pesticides on uh, the file uh, at the provincial level, which is there for years, but it became uh, far bigger at the national uh, level yesterday, uh, lately. Uh, there's been an announcement of suspending the decision of the PMRA and consultations on the Pest Control Products Act. According to you, what are uh, the factors for this debate? Where is the debate going in uh, Canada and in Quebec in 2022? And do you believe that governments will find solutions that will be good for all the stakeholders? Well, listen to me. I think that the solution won't be able to come only from the government, but will have to come essentially mostly from a government. Ideally, in all the consultations that we had in Quebec and elsewhere in Canada, uh, we spoke about the fact, and everybody agrees about that, that uh, we would like to be uh, to get rid of pesticides uh, realistically. Uh, we say that biological uh, pr uh, producers have the solution. Yes, indeed, probably. And even in biological production, we need science, though. We need uh, to have products uh, that are available that uh, enable us to fight against the enemies of agriculture. Now, we shouldn't be use pesticides, but currently we can't uh, think about it. We need replacement products. We need support to adopt new practices, new alternative practices. Uh, public research on pesticides is absolutely necessary. And uh, we hear that more and more because up to now, well, lots uh, uh, that we hear is about uh, private uh, research and research by manufacturers themselves. And uh, we also have uh, the uh, Pest Management Regulatory Agency in Canada. So we need uh, the political will, as I said at the beginning, a real will to coordinate efforts uh, to reduce the weight of agricultural chemistry on the environment. And when we talk research, there's really an important consensus where last uh, summer, uh, the government and the PMRA uh, decided uh, to, uh, to look for higher, uh, who refused the uh, food that required higher levels of uh, pesticides and people uh, said bravo, uh, but uh, there were farmers in Quebec and consumers that were very happy about that, but all of that is there. But it is now that we have to, uh, uh, to state a real political commitment. Uh, uh, one need research, needs research for replacement products, something that's softer for the environment, that is less risky for the citizen's health. And that is what concerns many people and feeds a lot of the conversation on pesticides, the concern citizens have about their health. And if we talk citizens, uh, farmers are also worried about uh, health issues. So. If I come to my conclusion, among others, we don't uh, 
uh, recognize the uh, cumulative effects of absorption of small doses of multiple products. So we have to look for things on that side as well. To end, we really need a political policy in that sense, and things have to be uh, foreseeable in agri-food. And also we need security and all of that is good for business. It's not uh, uh, an obstacle for business uh, to look for environmental improvements, such as uh, using uh, pesticides less than before. And by doing so, we'll have consumers that will support further agriculture and agri-food in Quebec. There you go. I'll now move to uh, our first question for Kathleen Sullivan. Kathleen Sullivan is the CEO of Food and Beverage Canada, uh, Aliment et Boisson Canada, the national association representing Canada's food and beverage manufacturing sector. Kathleen has over 25 years experience as an association leader, policy advisor, and government and regulatory and public affairs practitioner with extensive experience in the agri-food and grocery industry. Kathleen, um, my question for you touches on, on labor. Um, you know, for, first, am I right to assume that most food processors would list labor as one of their biggest challenges throughout 2021 and that it's causing a major concern for 2022? We saw in, in Minister Bibo's mandate letter that uh, labor is an immediate priority. Uh, the Prime Minister directing her to develop a sector specific strategy to address persistent and chronic labor shortages in farming and food processing. You know, I was curious, what do you see coming out of the strategy? What, what, what do you see changing in labor policy in 2022? Uh, so first off, hi, Tyler, it's good to see you. Uh, and hello to everyone. Uh, yes, uh, labor, I think you would hear across the board is the number one issue that's facing food and beverage manufacturers right now. Uh, in fact, it has been an issue for quite a few years. So even uh, three years ago, before COVID even struck, we were uh, raising the alarm uh, with different orders of government, letting them know that we were uh, facing a pretty, what we thought was going to be a pretty dire labor problem, partly driven by just shifting demographics uh, in the Canadian, um, in Canadian society where we're seeing uh, sort of a retirement cliff coming as the baby boomers age, and partly because of challenges that we have continued to face in food processing, and I know primary agriculture has as well, in trying to attract uh, workers to our sectors. When COVID hit, we were running as food and beverage manufacturing at about a 10% vacancy rate, sort of structural vacancy rate across the sector on average. Uh, and through COVID, I think like many other sectors, what we've seen is this real shift in how uh, people view their relationship with work. And we've seen an exodus of workers out of our sector. Uh, sometimes people leaving uh, just to find other jobs, bear in mind, if you work in a food and beverage manufacturing plant, you are working in a congregate setting. Companies have invested uh, at this point, uh, we would estimate over a billion dollars in measures for social distancing, measures to protect workers through um, PPE. Uh, but at, at the end of the day, uh, people uh, have increased choices of where they want to work. And so we've seen people leave. And we've also very sadly seen workers burning out um, you know, uh, food plants didn't shut down in COVID at any point in time. And so our workers are tired. Sometimes they're physically burned out. Sometimes they're emotionally burned out. Right now, we're looking at a structural deficit of about 15 to 20%. So imagine that across the country, plants are saying that they have upwards of 20% uh, constant vacancy rate. This is not related to Omicron. This isn't people calling in sick. It's a structural vacancy rate. And it's a rate that we expect to continue even as we see COVID uh, subside. I will just note that if you add on the effect of Omicron right now, uh, we are suggesting that you add another 10%. So if your vacancy rate was 15%, you're probably now at 25 uh, because of the Omicron effect. So labor is obviously uh, a huge concern and it's also really a, a distraction in terms of being able to look at other issues like how do you grow the sector. Uh, we were really pleased, as you can imagine, that uh, both Minister Bibo and also Minister Qualtro's mandate letters 
acknowledge, first of all, the economic statement acknowledged, I think for the first time we've ever seen that there are industries in Canada that do have sort of chronic and persistent uh, labor shortages. And even acknowledging that, acknowledging that was a huge step forward. Then Minister Bebo and Minister Qualtro's mandate letters did, as you pointed out, Tyler, specifically ask them to identify short and long-term strategies to address the labor problem in both primary agriculture and food and beverage manufacturing. So long-term, um, we are working Food and Beverage Canada with Canadian Agriculture Human Resource Council and uh, uh, Canadian Federation of Agriculture are chairing a two-year project uh, working with industry to identify longer-term solutions to this problem. We, we simply cannot find ourselves uh, going forward in the situation we are now. Um, we, we, you know, the, the challenge you've got, I mean, right now what companies have been doing uh, when they started to see vacancy rates in COVID, they used a lot of different strategies. So you, you may, you slow down your lines, you add overtime shifts, you rationalize your product offerings to try to keep the same volume of food coming out of a plant. But, you know, there's no more tricks in the bag, if you will. Companies have been doing these things for a couple of years. If, if we don't start to address this vacancy rate on a more sustained and permanent basis, you're likely to see industry start to contract. So we're working as industry collectively with primary agriculture on a long-term piece that will cover a lot of things. It will cover how do we enhance automation in this country? How do we make ourselves more attractive employers? And also how do we increase the labor pool either by uh, enticing people away from other sectors, tapping into underrepresented groups, looking at the role of foreign workers. So we've got a really important project underway, uh, but I will tell you companies will, will say today that they are in crisis mode uh, and we need uh, sh short-term solutions as well. And short-term solutions really means immediate solutions. So we're also working, Tyler, with uh, the federal government. We've put in a, a proposal to them for an 18-month emergency foreign worker program. Uh, to really tie industry over through uh, what are probably uh, the most difficult times that we've seen in the history of the sector. And and do you expect or, or do you see, so is, that 18 months will give you then the opportunity to have that breathing room and then yeah. look look to those longer term solutions? Is, is that, that how you see that, that playing out? Exactly. So uh, interestingly, we had already started work on all of this and the minister's mandate letters kind of line up as well, identifying the need for a long term strategy, but also some short term solutions. Um, so yes, we're, we're looking at, let's put in place, we, we have to, we just have, don't have a choice here. Our, our workers are tired, they're burned out. Um, these people have gone to work every day in food plants uh, to make sure that Canadians can eat Canadian food, and they've done that for two years. We've got to throw them a lifeline. Um, and we need a short term, like a strategy that comes into place immediately, lasts, let's say, 18 months. Well, industry starts to identify what are some transformational things we need to start doing. Uh, or change what we're doing or stop things that we're doing so that we longer term are in a position where we have the workforce that we need to keep the food system going. And, and that is a combination of the number of people that we've got working. And it's also a combination of the skills that people have. Um, I, I'm sure uh, many who are listening to this are well aware that we do have a structural shortage of skilled tradespeople in this country. RBC has estimated, I believe, we'll be short 100,000 people by 2025 in skilled trades. You can't run a construction industry. You can't run a manufacturing industry, uh, other industries if you don't have skilled trades. These are things that we have to federally and provincially, but as a country, get our heads around and, and just start to deal with. Um, so we've got some really big pieces that we need to sort out uh, industry is taking the lead on that, but this is really a challenge we have across the board as a country. I think COVID has, I hope it's shown us one thing, and that is the value of having domestic industries for our critical infrastructure sectors. So food is critical infrastructure. Uh, imports are great and exports are great. We're very active in the export market. We, we certainly want to continue with that, but we also do want to ensure that we've got a certain baseline level of activity in our domestic food system so that we've got you know, some guarantee of food security and food sovereignty from a Canadian perspective uh, that will tie us over in times of trouble. And the great news is with a sector like ours, 
uh, we have demonstrated that our economic contribution is quite significant as well. So you, you can do that, uh, ensure you've got food sovereignty by maintaining the food system, but also make sure you're contributing to essentially provincial and the national economies at the same time. So there, there's great potential wins here. And I will just point out, I mean, uh, food and beverage manufacturing, I think people don't realize this, uh, we're not just an add-on uh, in the food system, we're actually the largest manufacturing employer in the country. And if you take a look at our employment levels relative to automotive and aerospace, we are larger than both of those combined when it comes to employment. And food is everywhere across the country. So in terms of uh, economic contribution and community contribution, uh, you know, there, there's so many benefits to maintaining the food system. And we spend a lot of time talking about how important the food system is. We don't spend nearly as much time doing the hard work and making the hard decisions about how you ensure its strength and its sustainability. Great, uh, and that's that's that hard work is something I'm sure we'll pick up later uh, with, with the audience questions. Now we'd like to uh, uh, turn to Professor Ricky Yatta. Uh, Ricky comes to us from uh, British Columbia, where he is the Dean of the Faculty of Land and Food Systems at the University of British Columbia. With prior experience in many managerial roles at the University of Guelph, Mr. Yatta serves on numerous boards involved in food science research and technology and is past president of the Dean's Council of the Faculties of Agriculture, Food and Veterinarian Medicine in Canada. Uh, Professor, I'm gonna, gonna touch on, on something that I think uh, building on Kathleen's language can be one of these big wins for Canada. You know, your, your academic work is focused on, on food science, looking at, at things like the application of food related nanoscale science and technology. You know, your work with the Dean's Council has looked at trying to secure additional funding to do more of this research and innovation so, so Canada can do more to lead on the future of food. I was wondering how, how do you think Canada is doing on research and innovation and, and what changes are you hoping to see in, in the policy landscape in 2022? Well, thanks, Tyler. And uh, before I answer that question, I'll just do a land acknowledgement also. Uh, I'm here in my office at the University of British Columbia. So we're on the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam First Nation and the Coast uh, Salish people. And we're very grateful to be able to share the lands. Um, you know, following Lionel and Kathleen, I think they stole a lot of the thunder um, that I was going to talk about. Um, I'll speak, Tyler, probably more in my role with the, the Dean's Council. And for those of you who are joining us uh, and don't know what the Dean's Council is, um, there are 13 members of the Deans of Agriculture, Food and Veterinary Medicine. And it does stretch from coast to coast. So from uh, Vancouver to PEI. Uh, and so we as a group, have taken on some really tough questions, the, you know, the real tough questions. And I think you know, what Kathleen and Lionel were, were referring to, issues around food security, and, you know, and that's been overlaid with the climate change issues. And if you wanna see the extremes, come out to BC where you know, people have probably seen or read that we've gone from drought to flood and the impact that's had on the agri-food supply chain. And that's overlaid with COVID. And so, you know, the issue of, and Kathleen identified this as the importance of local uh, for food security. Wow, I think this is one thing that really has been highlighted through this last few years. But to answer your question, Tyler, you know, with regards to research and development, is there ever enough money that's invested into agri-food given the importance of the sector to Canada, which I would argue is either one or two, you know, no, we need more money. And I'll give a shout out right now um, to the government uh, because of recent investments. You know, you can talk about the Canadian Food Innovation Network or in the Protein Innovation Network or my colleagues at the Canadian Agri-Food Automation and Intelligence Network. And I see a couple of the board members are participants. So uh, hello to you. But these are all wonderful investments, you know. But we need to have a mechanism for a couple of things. How do we actually replace deteriorating infrastructure 
because as academic institutions, you know, what we're responsible for is primarily developing human capital, the next leaders and thought leaders for the food industry or agri-food industry. But we need to train them on state-of-the-art equipment. And so recently the Dean's Council have been working on a proposal and um, for those of you who want more detail, please contact Roger Larson or Sharon Leslie, who are at our main office in Ottawa to get more details. But we're really trying to make a play for how do we get more money specifically targeted to the agri-food industry with the underlying thought that let's make Barton's report a reality. You know, and, you know, I was looking back and my God, it's now close to six years, five to six years since Dominic put out that report. I know that COVID has really warped our sense of time, but holy crow, you know, I was just thinking to myself last night, Tyler, that it was only a couple of years ago. And then I went back and I go, oh my God, it was 2016, 2017. And in that report, as people probably recall, Dominic said, you know, this is an industry that we need to support given its vital importance to this nation to make it competitive and not only competitive, but to secure the food supply system in Canada. And so again, we're trying to make this thing a reality through these recommendations. And, you know, the deans from the veterinary medicine faculties college are, are working on this concept of one health, you know, zoonosis, the transmission of, of diseases from animals to humans. And, you know, you can debate how COVID actually started, but, you know, COVID is going to be not the last challenge we're going to have. And so we need to be able to do that, address that. You know, the ag and food deans are working on, you know, development of human capital around some things like, as you said, nanotechnology, innovative stuff, uh, sustainable farming, right? Vertical farming, things like that, uh, digital agriculture, you know, and I think what we're trying to also do is help expand the definition of agriculture. You know, uh, Kathleen made reference to the fact of skilled labor. And, you know, agriculture is a high tech industry. And I don't think a lot of people recognize that. So we need to work on that. We need to work on policy, Tyler, that will make it easier for what I would argue SMEs to translate innovative ideas and technologies to commercially viable technologies and ideas. I think, you know, for most SMEs, they just worry about getting through the day. We need to make or find systems that will make it easier for them to actually do that translation. We need to actually help them navigate the regulatory framework. Because at the end of the day, if it doesn't pass regulatory approval, then it may just be a good idea. So we need to do that. Land prices are another thing. You know, if companies want to actually set up shop, well, I don't think uh, I need to say too much, you know, regardless of where you are in the country, land prices are a big challenge. And then finally, I think, uh, and I'll leave it here before I pass it on, is that we need to have greater coordination among the ministries. And, you know, I would say with AFC, I said, you know, public safety, you know, uh, Minister Eng's ministry, uh, Minister Qualtro's, you know, because I think of BC, you know, going through these floods and wildfires, and we really were reactionary. We didn't have a plan B. And so I think coordination of the ministries um, would help in developing a plan B for crises. Hopefully we don't have too many crises, but I think we need to do that. So um, I know it's not a policy thing, it's just basically a networking thing. So 
I'll leave it there, but uh, thank you again for inviting us uh, to participate on behalf of the Dean's Council, really. Great. Well, th thank you very much for that answer. And so we'll go to our, our last uh, panelist. And, and uh, before we do that, just to remind everyone, you've got the opportunity to put some questions in the chat box. Please do that. We've got a couple of, that have come in already, uh, and so we'll go to them after. But, but first, uh, I'd like to turn to Alana Cook. Alana is a farmer and industry leader longtime ag champion, former senior government executive and experienced corporate director, and currently board chair at the Global Institute of Food Security at the University of Saskatchewan. She was deputy minister of agriculture for nine years in Saskatchewan, and uh, her contributions to the industry were recognized in 2011 when she was inducted into the Saskatchewan Agriculture Hall of Fame. Alana, I asked Kathleen about uh, something that was in Minister Bebo's mandate letter. I'd like to ask you about something that, that was not in it. You know, trade plays a vital role in the success of the Canadian agriculture and, and, our, and our food system as a whole. Uh, exporting more Canadian food can be a benefit to the environment, to the economy and food security, both locally, nationally and internationally. However, after years of disruption in these global trading systems, uh, we, without a, a major pressing trade negotiation in sight and, and this, this uh, development of a multitude of minor market access issues, trade doesn't seem to be getting the same attention from governments or from stakeholders that it did maybe even three years ago. How do, how do you see the state of agri-food trade policy today and, and do you see anything changing in 2022? Yeah, thanks very much, Tyler. And uh, hello, everyone, and thanks for thanks for uh, having this event, uh, Kathy, and thanks for the invitation to be part of it. So I think it is concerning that uh, we, in fact, didn't see trade mentioned in Minister Bebeau's letter. And, uh, you know, trade's always been a priority for both uh, the trade minister as well as the agriculture minister. So I, uh, I hope this doesn't mean that our agriculture minister isn't going to be paying attention to trade because clearly uh, it's vital. Canada is uh, the world's fifth largest agri-food exporter. Uh, we've unfortunately fallen uh, in the global race. We used to be third largest, you know, 15 to 20 years ago. So you can see the global competition is definitely there. So we have to be focused on uh, agri-food uh, exports and trade um, as uh, strong advocates, uh, but then very strategic in our policy efforts. And it's definitely a concern that we didn't see it in the minister's letter. The other thing I think that is important to mention is, is that our trade minister, um, international trade is, is a full portfolio, but our, our trade minister has a heavy portfolio load. Um, you know, she also has other responsibilities on uh, small business and on other uh, portfolios that have been put on her plate. And clearly, this is going to be a challenge for her to be able to manage all of these important portfolios. So um, good on her for taking this on. But I think the key is going to be, does she have enough uh, time? And, uh, you know, just her, her own, uh, you know, busy portfolio may not allow her to focus enough on international trade. You know, wh why is trade important? Well, I mean, Canada is an exporting nation, as I mentioned, we're fifth largest agri-food exporter in the world. We're vital as a key player, player in global food security. Uh, we are one of the most sustainable, if not the most sustainable food producer in the world. Uh, it's vital for our economy. Um, you know, last I looked it's $67 billion in agri-food exports. Uh, we provide a million jobs. Um, you know, that, that's why trade's important. And then, you know, what's happening on the trade front, as you mentioned, Tyler, it seems as if we're not hearing a lot on trade policy and you know it seems as if there's not big um, trade negotiations that are going to occur in 2022 and yet if you kind of look at the list um, that is out there what could be happening in 2022 could be and should be um, you know customer implementation uh, we understand there is a, a UK deal likely to be negotiated um, Indonesia we understand you know should be some trade negotiations starting in 2022 with Canada the ASEAN region and Canada, um, you know, should be proceeding with negotiations. India uh, seems to be back on the table, which is really good news. Um, you know, so so are we going to have attention on India? Uh, and then there should be a real focus on ACETA implementation, though it seems as if that's delayed. And really, that that should be proceeding in 2022. And then, you know, the other big thing that I think is on the trade policy front in 2022, you know, I just mentioned the trade negotiations that should be an opportunity, but the big threat, I think, 
um, is the EU uh, Farm to Fork Initiative, which you know they're using their domestic agenda to really, I think, try to influence international trade policy. This is a real concern when we see them focusing on uh, what might be important domestic issues, but frankly, you know, has that counter um, result, which is they they're coming at it from an environmental priority lens, and yet the the result. Uh, is going to be less environmentally friendly um, food production, so you know less sustainable. So it's kind of a, a counter, uh, a counter result. So then, what's at stake for Canada and agri-food in 2022? Well, it's a busy trade calendar that we see in front of us for 2022, and yet we don't really see, um, you know, clarity in what Canada is trying to achieve. Um, as I mentioned, the trade minister's got a lot on her plate. Uh, we know there's a climate agenda uh, from the federal government and certainly a diversity and inclusion agenda. I'm not saying those aren't important, but um, you know, priorities need to be on uh, clarity, on an ambitious trade agenda, on growing Canada's um, ability to uh, export agriculture and food. We need a proactive agenda rather than reactive. And I think what's needed, uh, Ricky mentioned, you know, the Dominic Barton report that is now dated, but, you know, there was a stated priority in agriculture and food, and yet we are not really seeing a strategic focus from our federal government on trade policy. Um, we hear them talking about promotion, but we don't really see them talking about advocacy. In fact, uh, the, the trade minister's uh, mandate letter talked about promotion, but not advocacy and action. Uh, we need resources and capacity, and um, you know we need accountability and transparency. We also, I think, need from the provincial governments a renewed level of engagement and attention and leadership. And I think we're seeing a little bit of that. You know, I know even from my home province in Saskatchewan, I, I think they're really trying to drive this. But I think we're seeing less coordination across the provinces than would be most helpful. Um, and then, of course, we need diligent and relentless pressure from the industry. And I recognize it's fatigue and frustration from industry because it seems that trade never seems to progress. But, you know, I guess I would just say uh, renew your commitment to trade policy. It's really important. And um, I think on the federal side, I'm sort of hearing in the mix that we probably need more boots on the ground. We've seen lots of retirements and churn in the federal service and even in international offices and embassies. So. We need that focus on science, problem solving, preventing problems, um, stronger advocacy, and stronger communication with the sector, so that the industry recognizes, um, you know, that the federal government is focusing on this and is and is putting resources where it's needed on the science side. Um, we've got strong global competitors. Unless we get our act together and really get strategic, I, I think we could lose ground, and this has huge risk for Canada and huge risk, frankly, for the world as we provide uh, some of the most sustainable food. Uh, for our uh, our hungry around the world. Great, thank thank you, Alana. And so so we're going to turn now to some questions. I'm going to start with some questions from the audience, and and we'll we'll ask this one to each of the four panelists. Alana, I'm going to start with you first, Anna. Um, this question comes from from uh, Deb Stark, one of our board members at CAPI. These are all so we we've talked about pesticides, labor, trade, and research. These are all issues that we're well aware of. Again, these are issues that, that dominated headlines in 2021 that are going to continue to, to dominate headlines in 2022. What, what are the issues, though, that, that we're not talking about that are coming at us? What, what, are, what uh, do you see happening in 2022 that, that hasn't attracted headlines or isn't getting the attention that it deserves? So, Alana, can I start with you with, with uh, an answer on that? Yeah. Well, good question, uh, Deb, um, and, and uh, thanks for the question. You know, I, I don't know, like I, I am very worried that, um, you know, we don't have our, our uh, policy house in order and that we haven't recognized um, the impact of policy and getting unintended consequences. So I think what we're, we're probably, I mean, maybe industry is talking a little bit about it, but I'm not sure it's gotten government attention that uh, while there are maybe laudable goals on um, the current agenda, on sustainability, on less environmental impact, on um, you know uh, impact on climate of our sector, I'm not sure we're focused enough on what the risk side is of that agenda. What are the unintended consequences of um, what might seem like good goals and worthy goals, but not recognizing what impact that's going to have on our ability to uh, remain sustainable, continue to produce food, um, 
sustainably and I just I just worry about that. I'm not sure all of us are talking about that enough and I, I think the industry maybe needs to sort of almost um, grab a hold of the sustainability agenda and kind of turn the page a little bit on how we are sustainable and proving up our sustainability um, measures and approaches. And I'm not sure we're talking enough about that. Thank you. Uh, Ricky, uh, your thoughts on an issue that we, we are not talking about. Uh, well, there's been a little bit of discussion, Tyler, and I think all of us have seen, you know, the increases in food prices a and we talk about them and then, you know, we struggle with how do we actually deliver affordable food to those people, healthy food to those who need it. And so that's going to be a challenge, that kind of tension. And I know that, you know, Sylvain Charlebaugh, my co former colleague at Guelph and now at Dalhousie does a food price index report. And that's a little bit scary to me when you see these increasing food prices. So, you know, how are we gonna manage that issue? And I think what has happened too is that, you know, because of all of these things that are happening at the same time, climate change, COVID, right, et cetera, we've been in complete reaction mode rather than being proactive. And, you know, a, a colleague of mine who's down in the States and I'm fortunate to serve on his foundation board where he funds things. And he says to me, we're only gonna fund those things that are crazy. We don't do that in Canada. We're so risk adverse, right? So. In those crazy ideas, yeah, a lot of them probably won't pan out, but there may be the diamond in the rough. And we need to actually, at the time of crises, also be risk takers. Interesting. Interesting thoughts. Kathleen, what's an issue that we're not talking about enough? Oh, you're muted, uh, Kathleen. I, uh, I muted myself. You guys muted me again. So <laughs> I am... Um... I, I think I will just sort of preface this by saying that uh, the reason we are talking about the same old things is because the same old things are still problems. And when, you know, we've, we've heard a couple of people allude to the Barton report, for example, there's lots of other reports, we need to solve these problems. Uh, and that's why people keep talking about them. But I, I think what will happen over the next year is that one um, sort of a trend, if you, if you will, is that we're going to see layering of pressures on a system that is already pushed to the edge. And that will be through further supply chain disruptions. And it's going to be through as government starts to get itself back to its ordinary world, layering of new regulations. So really we haven't as industry had to deal certainly uh, for food processing, a lot of regulations that were coming were deferred uh, for a period of time. So if we look at some labeling regulations, uh, if we think about the plastics ban, we're going to see added pressure and there's not a lot of capacity within the industry, even through the associations, for example, to really deal with those questions and do the thorough analysis that's necessary to contribute to policy development because even the associations and the companies are just focused on crisis management. The other thing I think that is going to happen is the risk opportunity that Alana really pointed out. So things like sustainability, where we really should be focusing on how do we make things better? How do we introduce more automation? How do we look at how we become more uh, innovative as Ricky has pointed out? And I think that is the opportunity cost of being constantly uh, caught up in this crisis mode. Ultimately, we need to be having what, what I think in old fashioned terms was an industrial policy. How do we take all of these factors and put it together and lay a roadmap out for these sectors and frankly for many other sectors in the economy as well. And that's something that we're missing. So I see more and more pressure this year to Deb's uh, question and missed opportunities to, for industry to really contribute to some significant policy discussions that governments are going to have, but industry won't have the capacity to participate in the way we should. Thank you. Et uh, finalement, M. Levin, à quoi vous pensez sur cette question-là? And finally, uh, uh, Mr. Levin, what do you think about this question? Uh, Mr. Levac, yes. Uh, yes, an issue uh, that isn't getting the attention it should get. 
There are probably several of them, but uh, what uh, impresses me and it uh, comes out of the discussion this morning is that one says frequently that in the sector, each of the domain each of the sectors works in silos in an isolated way. There aren't enough things that are coordinated. The information uh, on agri-food in general, trade, production, innovation, environment, all of that, all that information is treated in an isolated manner, in silos again. And we do not make sufficient connections between the effects, the impacts, the influences of each sector on the others, each of the subsectors on the others. And some examples, uh, for example, uh, we saw reports on the lack of veterinarians in certain regions, uh, Abitibi, Temiscabang in uh, Quebec. Well, uh, a lack of uh, labor in a very specialized uh, world. Uh, well, there's training. Uh, Ricky spoke about it indeed. We need to establish this connection more uh, strongly. Now, uh, food uh, transformation, uh, what are the effects on the market, really? What are the effects on export? Uh, when we think, for example, about Colonel in his activities in Quebec, he's trying to reduce uh, its capacities, uh, its production, and the effect is going to be very direct on commerce. There's going to be priority given to uh, Canadian trade, but international trade is going to be reduced. What to do with political will, will in Ottawa? Uh, how to reduce uh, dependence with China, for example? Uh, the biggest producer of pork in Canada, uh, is, it, is it in a context where we want to reduce things and uh, our dependence uh, in China for import, imports and exports? So there's a multitude of things like that uh, that we do not connect one to the other. And all the Canadian system of uh, supply management, all of that is at risk of suffering not the tr trade agreements because uh, you know we we managed to get along but uh, to be able to see uh, that uh, for example excel door uh, that uh, grows uh, chicken, for example, say uh, we cannot manage with internal uh, commerce other provinces will they be in able to increase production of poultry. Uh, so the, this wants to uh, say that there is a destabilization of the system. And I think that we could take a multitude of other examples uh, that uh, make uh, that in spite of Canadian general policies in agriculture, for example, Guelph's declaration uh, of the ministers of agriculture that was that happened recently. Uh, in spite of all those policies, do we have really in place a way to coordinate all of that and uh, to take to the society a real statement of global impact of everything that's going on in the sectors and subsectors, research, innovation, training, recruitment, immigration. We have to connect all of that. The policies have to be translated by an, a line of action that is coordinated and information that's better, best coordinated as far as the connections of all of that in Canada. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Levesque, I'm going to continue with you for a second and give uh, the opportunity to the others to respond as well. We have several questions concerning your answer about the matter of pesticides that uh, show the dynamic that exists around the matter of the future of pesticides and uh, rules around pesticides in Canada. For example, uh, uh, there's a question about the fact that uh, the governments are telling us that we should trust vaccines for COVID. 
that the system works, that science works. But it seems that with pesticides, people are saying that maybe uh, the rules framework that we cannot trust it as much like we should uh, trust the COVID vaccines. Another question, how can we find a better solution to use pesticides appropriately, but also Europe? The fact that even European farmers are asking for access they're worried about uh, the impact on uh, yield and demand of emergency authorizations. For example, beets in France. So there are many questions there, but maybe you could uh, say a word about that and then I'll give an opportunity to the other panelists to respond. Yes, that's absolutely true. There's a contradiction. Uh, before the fact that when we talk pesticides, we say, no, we shouldn't trust uh, the companies, the manufacturers, we have to do independent research. Yes, it's true. Why should we say that uh, we should trust uh, manufacturers of chemical products and pesticides and uh, with vaccines, we say, no problem, we trust them, we use the vaccines, etc. That proves once again that information, information in all its forms, there are very specialized uh, places, but we have to know as much as possible. And we have to have a specialized emissions. I saw uh, last week in Radio Canada on TV, something about the matter of vaccines. Well, you need to have tens, hundreds of those uh, programs all over the country about everything, not only about vaccines. So information, yes, currently there's contradiction and we really have uh, to underline that problem. On the other hand, when we talk about Europe as to pesticides, yes, there's pressure on the part of producers that would like to be able to use certain products that are uh, limited or uh, forbidden at the present time, but the EU and other countries, we shouldn't forget, uh, countries in the EU are working and are talking about reciprocity to ask foreign countries to bring uh, products that only respond to the standards of their own territories. So there's all this matter and Canada could do the same. Canada uh, it depends on this reciprocity of the market, but uh, Canada doesn't talk reciprocity about its own market. Fruits, vegetables, inspections are random. There should be more, of course. I'm not saying that's a, that it's a catastrophe. One should be aware of all of that, though. And indeed, we are proving that in Europe, uh, they're facing problems that are similar to the ones I spoke at the beginning. Beginning. Uh, we need uh, further research for replacement products. Do we, we must do more research for the environment as well, but for production as well, because we can't reduce considerably uh, production. Quite the contrary, we should increase it in the next few years. So one must coordinate once again all these points of view, all these directions and how to do it well with a public funds being injected for sure, research, development, choice of technologies, uh, support of research groups, etc. Uh, et I saw cetera, you uh, uh, nodding you. along and uh, your, your thoughts on this, this question. Is that over to me, Tyler? Yes. Okay, sorry, you cut out there for a minute. Okay, well, I might just add, absolutely, it's a, it's, it's, it's a total contradiction. Um, you know, if science uh, matters and is credible, then um, it should matter across all uh, components of science. So um, vaccines, yes, are uh, scientifically proven and important, and pesticides are too, uh, as are fertilizers, as are uh, many modern agriculture uh, tools and practices. So, you know, you, you can't be contradicting 
um, you know, on the policy side. So I think you've made a great point there in, in the, in the um, you know, the questioner made a great point. And what I would say is science drives sustainability. So if that, if sustainability is the goal that we claim we want to have on using science, then science is the solution, but then we need to be true to science. We need to be consistent, whether it's, um, you know, in health or in agriculture. Thank you. Uh, Ricky, your, your thoughts on this? Yeah, um, I think this is the classic risk benefit analysis challenge. And what it also underscores, I think, Tyler, is the whole notion of science based policy and regulation. And I think, you know, fortunately in Canada, we're really good at that. You know, some may argue it's, it's cumbersome, but, you know, I would say that we're in a good system. Great. Thank you. Kathleen, I'm not sure if you wanted to touch on that. You know, I'm not going to talk about pesticides. That's not my my sort of uh, wheelhouse, but I, but I will just echo some of the comments. I mean, you know, having a strong regulatory uh, system and network in Canada is, I think, one of the underpinnings of our uh, recognition globally in terms of how safe our food system is, how reliable it is to do business here and to accept our products. And um, we've, we've got to accept that. I mean, if we, uh, you know, it really goes to our regulatory system, our approval system for different products, whether it's in this space or it's in the healthcare space or in other spaces is very much science-based. And we have to, we have to recognize that system, uh, respect it and rely on it. And I don't think we can really cherry pick. That's not to say the system is always perfect and it, there's no place for improvement. Um, but I do think that we have to uh, very much recognize that um, certainly comes up in my industry and I think in others as well. Great, thank you. And, and so uh, we're, we're closing in on our, our time here. Again, these, these discussions always go faster uh, than, than I think they're going to. What I wanna do is ask a, a, one final question to the group that I think touches on comments that everyone has made around um, the silos that exist in agriculture, the need to work together, the challenges we have with coherence around policy making and again when you look at at uh, the questions in the in the that we've got from the audience uh, several touch on um, the need for leadership um, several touch on uh, you know are we doing enough to to tear down the silos are we doing enough to have a common vision are we doing enough to project and sell that that vision for agriculture I, I was wondering if if you could speak to uh, each offer your thoughts on um, how do we deliver that vision, that coherence from a policy perspective. That's what we're interested today in, in 2022. What, what steps should Canada's agri-food system be taking um, to harness the strengths, the assets that we have to come together um, and, and find solutions to the problems that it's gonna face in, in 2022? Uh, would someone like to volunteer to go? Maybe I'll just, Kathleen, give you the opportunity to go first on this one. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I think we've done a really uh, bad job of coordinating different levels of government uh, around issues. And I think we, we saw that through COVID. It is absolutely difficult to do. Uh, but as I have said throughout COVID, you know, 200,000 farmers, 8,000 food processors and 15,000 uh, grocery stores managed to keep the food system going. Uh, and that was complicated, but we did it. And we broke down our own silos and we worked together. Uh, it is very frustrating and difficult to hear uh, orders of government uh, debating with each other or lobbing the ball or that happening in ministers offices, you know, being sent back and forth. I, I, I think there's no excuse for it. I think it, it shouldn't be uh, acceptable. Um, but yeah, we saw it through COVID where, you know, we would ask questions about vaccines or even recently getting rapid tests. Well, that's what the province is now. It, it's just not acceptable anymore. I think the answer to that is more and more that industry needs to take ownership of its future and the future direction. If governments aren't going to create industrial policies or strategies, it is what it is. And we as industries then need to put up the money where our, our money where our mouth is. And we need to break down our own silos uh, within industry, start to work together more start to identify common visions for the sectors that we're in or the whole agri-food uh, system um, and start to work towards that and bring government in where we need to. And I, and I have to say that is happening. It's happening on labor. We've seen it happening on work on a code of conduct for the food system. Uh, we are really seeing where industry is starting to drive this and really looking to government to support or enable, but not to take a leadership role. 
I think that's unfortunate for governments. And I think they should be very, very wary of that uh, because power is starting to transfer. And I don't think that is good for government or necessarily for society overall. But I do think industry is going to have to step up and uh, play that leadership role. Thank you. Uh, Alana, you've spent time in and out of government. Your, your thoughts on this question? Yeah. You know, I, I think Kathleen has nailed it, which is industry needs to drive this. You know, governments should, but, um, but for various reasons won't and can't. Uh, and so industry needs to own this and really needs to decide what are what is our common purpose, where are our common goals. We can always find reasons to be, uh, you know, sort of arguing and, and, and being a bit territorial, but we need to get over that. Uh, nothing drives collaboration and coordination more than a crisis. And, and, and frankly, we've gone through the COVID crisis and now we're on the, you know, not on the other side of it, but we're finding our way through it. And there's too much at risk with, uh, you know, not getting coordinated and, and, and figuring out how to work together. So, you know, I, I think about in Saskatchewan, it was a, a provincial growth plan with key targets, with specific priorities, and then lining up the regulations and the policy and uh, resources to kind of make it happen. And industry absolutely, you know, came to the table and completely agreed because it had been developed collaboratively with industry. So if government isn't going to put together a plan for growth for agriculture and food, then we have to put it together ourselves. So I don't know, is it a national table? Is it a coalition approach? I'm not sure what it is, Tyler, but it's vital. Great. Thank you. R Ricky, your, your thoughts on on um, on this question? And, and again, I think you touched on, on this earlier, but the role that, that universities and can, can play in this? Well, I'll, I'll do a self-serving thing, uh, Tyler, and say that the, the Dean's Council would be you know, pleased to facilitate the meeting of the minds. And I think what people need to be reminded of, of one of the first principles at kindergarten, play nicely in the sandbox and share, right? So I think a shout out to Kathy though, uh, having the deputy ministers uh, forum, you know, that was an amazing thing that you were able to bring five deputy ministers together um, because I know their schedules are crazy. But I think we need to follow up on that kind of stuff. You know, we've been working with CFA, your organization, uh, the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities, the Super Clusters, the ICED4 stream, you know, CFIN. Um, we just need to get in a room and talk about some of the challenges. And let's get a game plan of how we're going to meet these challenges. I think there's enough talk about identifying the challenges. I think we all know what they are. We just need to have an action plan, I think, Tyler. So I'll leave Great. it there. Great, thank you. Uh, Mr. Levesque, the final final, it's that step you uh, to uh, Mr. Levesque, uh, last words, uh, it's up to you. Is it my turn? Yes. Yes, I apologize. Yes, the sound got a little bit cut. Look, essentially, I agree uh, with everything that was just said, but just uh, note, when I spoke about the system and all of that, I am not questioning the system in Canada. Ricky said that uh, we have a good system in Canada. Yes, I agree. Indeed, I don't want to demolish. I just want to improve it, complete it, and to have uh, more uh, funding so the tools are more developed and for our capacity to be able to face this obligation of innovation, of research, of improving our production, our uh, processing. So we have to improve the system. Now, as to how we could uh, break those silos, well, we have to create more tools that would be internal maybe to each of the provinces, but also pan-Canadian. And we're capable of doing it. It's enough just to put in place certain mechanisms and certain reflexes to, in a more systematic uh, way, uh, put together what's happening in our big agri-food system in the country. For example, I'm thinking of uh, food processors that uh, developed the Pan-Canadian Association two years ago already, and they uh, developed a tool by which this group in all the provinces can uh, intervene and influence the policies or the uh, guidelines. I'm thinking of another thing that's not very well known before the current uh, pandemic of COVID-19. It seemed uh, that we were far less prepared uh, than uh, the agri-food world 
as to the possibility of the arrival uh, to our uh, territory of uh, the African uh, pork uh, fever and uh, an update uh, was implemented and up to now uh, uh, to see whether there were any uh, emergencies in the country and, uh, and to uh, br put a break on the risks. So if we could act in this domain uh, as uh, it is done in other uh, fields to act in animal health, we could find many more solutions for all of agri-food in the country. Um... Thank you, everyone. Thank you to all of the panelists for for your your engagement today. Again, I enjoyed this this lively dialogue, and and um, and, and and I think it's th that that note to end on around finding solutions. I think everyone talked about. You know, we we we've done we do such a good job of understanding what our challenges are, but how how do how do we come together to develop those those solutions so that we can take advantage of all that all of the potential and really maximize the full potential that. Canada's agri-food system has to be a significant economic, environmental, food, food security provider for this country to really drive growth and, and the long-term uh, success of Canada. And so, so you know, th this, this is a challenge that we think a lot about internally at CAPI, the role that we can play, and we look forward to continuing to engage with all of you and all of our, our participants on the webinar and other stakeholders in the agri-food system in that dialogue in the year ahead. Um, thank you again. Uh, all attendees will receive a link to, to the recording and that'll be made available. So if you've enjoyed this discussion and want to share it with others in your network, please do. We encourage everyone to join the CAPI mailing list so that you can stay up to date on CAPI events and research throughout the year. Again, I'd like to highlight that we have a webinar coming up on February 16th on soil health, featuring, featuring our distinguished fellow, Dr. Susan Woodbaum, and our doctoral fellow, Mary Lee Sampson. Uh, please. Uh, join up for our mailing list to stay up to date on details on that upcoming webinar. Thank you again, everyone. Uh, enjoy um, the, the rest of your day. I, I hope those that are dealing with severe weather get, get through it. And uh, we can hopefully uh, enjoy a, a great, healthy, successful 2022. Thank you very much and have a great day.